Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, welcome to panel 3B. And my name is Lynn Repeth Martos. I'll be the moderator for this panel. And I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I recognize that we have individuals on this meeting from all parts of the country. Um, and I'm just really honored at the opportunity to speak with you today. Before we get started, I wanted to give a huge thanks to the sponsors of Panel 3B, the Macomb County Planning and Economic Development, um, and also to the event sponsors for today. So Eaton, um, First in Michigan, and AIAM, uh, which is the Aerospace Industry Association of Michigan. It's really, really great. Let me tell you a little tiny bit about me. Um, as I said before, I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And at JPL, we uh, specialize in creating innovative robotic non-manned missions for the exploration of our universe and beyond. And I wanna stress that the work that we do at JPL is all in robotics. Uh, we're not creating the next space shuttle. We are creating the next rovers or other interstellar explorers, but they're all mechanically driven. Um, some of you may have seen some recent news about a couple of our robotic explorers, the Mars 2020 mission, uh, the rovers named Perseverance, or Percy for short, and we just landed on Mars in February. Uh, but as Percy traveled from Earth to Mars, um, it had an extra visitor. I want you to think about like a kangaroo carries its baby around in its pouch. Well, Percy had a little robotic explorer nestled on its underbelly. That robotic explorer was the Ingenuity helicopter. This is a brand new concept. Um, we wanted to challenge ourselves to see if we could possibly attempt flight on another planet and the Ingenuity helicopter actually proved that it's possible. Big challenges there because the atmosphere on Mars is very different from the atmosphere on Earth. And as all of our aerospace professionals know, in order to fly, you kind of need atmosphere. Um, and in that really different environment, we had to create some very different mechanisms in order to achieve flight. The rotor blades are super huge and the payload of the helicopter is really, really tiny. Um, the work that I do at JPL though, I don't touch hardware. I'm a business manager at JPL. So what I do is I make all of those things possible. Um, I make sure that people have jobs that we can get them hired and onboarded, brought into our organizations. Uh, I make sure that they have offices when they need them and computers. Um, more importantly, I make sure that the funds that they have, that they're given to manage their missions, they're managing them appropriately, that they're sticking to their schedules and to their plans. And what I love most about my work is the innovative people. We have some of the most amazing innovators and thinkers on the planet. Uh, my section that I work in specifically is the project systems engineering and formulation section. Formulation is really that where do the nascent concepts come from of how can we explore these systems? For example, the helicopter. A long time ago, someone said, wouldn't it be cool? The, the people that I work with now are the ones who are saying, wouldn't it be cool if? And they're thinking years down the road. Wouldn't it be cool if we could explore Venus by using balloons to drop us gently through the atmosphere? Wouldn't it be cool if we could use a gang or a swarm of little tiny satellites uh, getting close to the sun in order to uh, study the, the solar uh, winds and the solar wind output? That's what formulation is. It's the people thinking not at the current mission, but three or four missions ahead on how we can do things. I mentioned uh, the Perseverance rover um, because it's got a very special mission that it's carrying out. It's going to collect soil samples from Mars and it's going to cache them or store them in tubes. And our goal, 
our hope is someday to be able to fly another mission to Mars to collect those tubes and another mission to take those tubes and launch them back up into the Martian atmosphere. And our goal would be to capture that spacecraft that has collected those samples and possibly bring those samples back to Earth. These, that I've just outlined two or three missions um, down the road, but wouldn't it be really cool to get those samples back on Earth so that we can really understand better the capabilities of, of, of life in Mars. That's a little about what I do at JPL and some of the cool stuff that we have, but we're joined here by a really wonderful panel today of professionals. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce each of them, actually to have them each introduce themselves. And we'll start with Lisa Peterson. Lisa is Vice President of Business Development and Marketing at Airspace Link Incorporated. Lisa. Great. Well, thank you, Lynn. And I guess thank you to the Women in Aerospace uh, of Michigan for asking me to join this panel. Uh, I've listened to a lot of the others and I'm just learning so much. Uh, you'll hear from me a little bit later about how I ended up in aerospace, aerospace, but I come at it from a business perspective. I have a background in business and building new businesses and uh, and marketing. So um, Aerospace Link is a tech startup based in Detroit. And like the name says, we are focused on creating the digital maps for the skies. So unmanned aircraft systems can fly safely. And it started uh, with the relationship that we have with the FAA. There's a, a program that requires pilots uh, of drones to obtain authorizations to fly legally when they're in airspace near an airport. So we are a provider of a digital application that we call AirHub for Pilots. So if there are any drone pilots in the room, you can go use our application and get authorized to fly safely. Uh, but it's also, it's doing more than that. We are focused on uh, very similar to what Misty Davies was talking about in the last panel, if anyone uh, heard her talk from NASA. And she's working on something called the System Wide Safety Assurance Program. We actually are also pursuing a data-driven approach to mitigating risk, not only in the air, but also on the ground. So these unmanned aircraft systems are flying at lower altitudes. You've seen maybe some of the videos of the alphabet wing bringing a package to a neighborhood. These, these drones are going to be flying over people where people live, work and play. So our goal is to work not only at the federal level where the FAA basically sets the rules and regulations of the airspace, but we're also working with local and state governments to integrate from their geospatial information systems, information about how cities are laid out, what critical infrastructure do drones need to avoid, uh, power lines, schools, hospitals, helipads. So basically we're providing a combination of the maps in the skies and the maps on the ground. And this becomes very important as we start to set the rules for how drones will travel beyond a visual line of sight. It's what, it's what it is called. And so we are building the new highways in the sky. We are approaching it at like a Google, Google Maps uh, would for the ground navigation. Uh, we're actually building the navigation and the routes as we build the roads in the sky. Uh, so we'll talk more about that. Again, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Lynn. That is super cool. Wow. I hadn't really thought about that, <laughs> but super, super cool. Thank you so much. I'd also like to introduce Kelsey Height. She's an aeronautical engineer associate at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Lancaster, California. Kelsey? Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, so I work at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, which is basically, we build a lot of the military airplanes that you see. So it's like the fighter jets and the spy airplanes and things like that. 
those are those are the types of airplanes that we're working on. Um, so what I do is I design structures within them. So work on you know what's actually going to be built. I would get to work with a lot of cool people who work on you know deciding if those structures are going to be strong enough or deciding what materials we should use or how we should power it, things like that. So you get a, to meet a lot of really cool people. Um, and I also have a background in first robotics. So I was on an FRC team for four years in high school. So I was on Team Virus 3547. Um, and then I was also on an FLL team for three years back when it was a middle school program. Um, so I did that for three years as well. And those definitely taught me what engineering is and how I could combine my passions of you know, math and airplanes and things like that into an actual career. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and talking to you guys. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it back to Lynn. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Well, to build on our first alumni experience, we're joined today also by three students who are current first team members. Um, I'd like to ask each of them to introduce themselves. Uh, Sumaya, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Um, yeah, uh, I'm asking, okay, can you hear me? Ah, okay. So, um, I go to Flix. I'm on the I'm on the FTC team, and I have been in robotics for two years, going on three. I think your microphone's cut out a little bit. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my name is, I go to Flix. I'm on the FTC team and I've been in robotics for about two years going on. And what is Flix? Flix is, um, it stands for Foreign Language Immersion and Cultural Studies. It's, um, so school where you can take four, either four languages, French, Japanese, Chinese, or Spanish. Um, yeah, they have a lot of cultural things there that you could um, do. They have cheer and a whole bunch of other stuff, including robotics. That is super cool. So you can do languages that humans speak, and you also get to do a little bit of work with languages that machines speak, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for being here today, Sumaya. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Andrea. Please tell us a little about yourself. Hi, um, my camera, um, I, I would like to show my face, but since I, uh, my camera thing is disabled, so um, I don't know how to fix that. Um, I don't know, it's just as disabled by host. But to begin, uh, my name is Andrea Mendez. I'm from... Um, Team, oh, okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, I'm from Team 5577, Kinematic Wolves. I've been a part of the team since my freshman year, so like three years now. I'm a junior. Um, so, yeah, um, is there anything else um, that needs to be said? Or is that, that's it, right? That's the question. That's, that's fantastic. Thank okay, you. Thank you. I'm so sorry if I missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. I love that background. Thank uh, you. Introduce Yaritza. Please yeah. tell us about yourself. Uh, okay, so my name is Yaritza. Um, I go to the Turkish history as well. Um, I've been, I'm on 5577. Uh, I've been in FRC for about, I'd say, three years now. So I'm also a junior. Um, and yeah, I've been involved with mainly the mechanical team this, uh, this year and the last year. But my freshman year, I bounced around a lot. So it was a lot of discovering my freshman year. Super cool. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to move into sort of a Q&A portion of our panel. And I would like to remind everyone it, who's joined this meeting, please, please, as questions arise, ask them in the chat. And I will address them back to our panelists. So uh, we're here to address any questions that you have. I have a few questions that I'd like to start with, though, and I'll start with Lisa. Um, Lisa, what inspired you to work in the aerospace industry? 
Okay, well, I have to be honest here. It was not expected. So this is normally how life is, right? <laughs> uh, the best laid plans, you, you, you really go many different directions. Uh, you might have a certain career path in mind uh, that in high school that changes once you get to college and then changes again once you get out of college. So uh, what brought me into aerospace is my experience with location-based services and navigation and working with data analytics as well as mobile communications. And it just so happens that in the aviation aerospace world, uh, we're testing a lot of autonomous aircraft now, right? We're working to take the humans out of the loop or some of the humans out of the loop so these aircraft can start to fly truly autonomous. And that's what's going on in the drone space, the unmanned aircraft system space. I had the opportunity in one of my roles focused on big data and analytics and machine learning to actually spend time with the ground-based autonomous vehicle manufacturers, helping the, those automotive companies determine where the first connected roads go that are going to enable these autonomous vehicles to run um, across them smoothly and without hazard. After spending time there, I thought, well, this is really exciting and data is such a big part of it. And so are mobile communications. My background is actually in mobile communications. These are all running on data networks <laughs> and the internet. And so the blend of my communications background, the data and analytics, and uh, having spent some time on the ground-based autonomous vehicle side really brought me into the unmanned aircraft system space. Uh, I had a lot of learning to do about aviation when I came here, again, because I'm coming at it from another direction. But what's interesting is, Everyone in aviation and aerospace who didn't have the mobile communications background or understanding of mobile applications and how those work didn't understand how it could all fit together when you're now talking about a drone that's going to operate all digitally and without any air traffic control like we have for big aircraft. They're also very hyper local uh, events that are happening. These flights are happening right in your community. So the mapping, going back to the mapping and the location-based services and the navigation, it's extremely important to get it right from a safety perspective. Wow. <laughs> when I think about ingenuity flying around on Mars, ingenuity doesn't have any of those challenges because no one else is flying there where we are. But I can see how important and critical it is to have that really solid understanding of the space and the communication tools. Really, really cool. Um, Kelsey, can you tell us a little bit about the most exciting project? Well, okay, at least the one that you can share with us given your work in Skunk Works. Yes, yeah, so I would say one of the most exciting projects that I worked on that I can talk about, um, so I can go into that a little bit too, but I, I worked on satellites for a little while when I was in college actually as an intern. Um, so over the summer, I worked up in basically with Silicon Valley, um, working on satellites for Lockheed Martin. And so that was really exciting because getting to see really the capabilities that we had was amazing. So we have these satellites, obviously up in space, you don't really think about them, but they can see images on the ground. So we can use them to very safely it's spying, but you can really safely spy on enemies that you're concerned about and you don't want to get close to because they might shoot down your airplanes or things like that. We can see them from space and just very cautiously make sure that everything's safe. So that was a really, really cool thing to get exposed to. Um, and then as, as Lynn said, a lot of things I also can't talk about, um, which is really exciting as well because you think of all the cool fighter jets and things like that that you've seen before. Those all started out as very secretive projects um that are are being used to help you know protect our country and spy on the enemy and things like that but we obviously don't want any dangerous countries to get a hold of our technology or understand what we're doing um so that's honestly another really cool aspect of our jobs is that 
We, we're really working on inventing the future, things that nobody has thought of or has seen. We're, you know, working on it all secretly. And it's, it's kind of a fun aspect of our job is knowing that someday, you know, you're going to see this airplane that I'm working on on the news and I'm going to know that I, you know, I had a hand in it. Um, so that's a really, really exciting part. You know, you feel like you're helping keep the country safe and, you know, inventing cool things. So that's, that's something I really enjoy as well. Super cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Andrea, can you tell us why did you join Team 5577 in the first place? How did you get into FIRST Robotics? Okay, so um, my freshman year, um, it's not like a big story or anything, but like I saw like the robot and I thought it was really cool. And um, I just decided to join because I thought the robot looked cool and I was like, I want to do something like that. Like, that looks really cool. Like, it had, like, everything. I don't know. I was just, like, interested as a freshman. And that's why I joined. Like, yeah. <laughs> but you stayed with it. You've been on the team for three years. So there's something about it being cool. What is that? Um, I like the community aspect of it. Like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, the robot is cool and stuff. But, like, I like enjoying um, working with my team a lot um, because... Out of robotics, it's just like people you never thought you'd hang out with or would be interested. But like in robotics, it's like everyone's like friends with each other. There's no like unfamiliarity. Everyone knows each other. Everyone like has fun with each other. And we all share like like most of the same goals, especially when it comes to building the robot, um, working on, you know, chairman's presentations, filming, planning, that kind of thing. And we all work together, like kind of like a family, um, mm -hmm. especially when we help um, other teams and like middle school teams uh so we're, we're like we I just like to think of our team as a family and that's why I really that's like an aspect I really enjoy about it super cool thank you so much uh Samaya I'd like to ask you the same question what is it about first that brought you on board you're at a very interesting school um sounds like a very diverse school so how did you get involved in first well okay so Initially, I wasn't, um, like, when I first came to the school, I didn't know about a lot of robotics, but um, before, my friend had told me about it, and I was, like, I just, like, shrugged it off. I wasn't that interested, but then I saw that my, I was looking at my dad a lot. He's an engineer, and I was, like, okay, I kind of want to do that when I get um, grow up, and that's when I saw that we had a team, so I just decided to join, and I was also kind of bored, and I wasn't really doing um, a lot when I was in, like, seventh, no, sixth grade, so I was kind of, like, bored, so I just decided to join, and then I did it as a joke at first, but then I started getting, like, really into it, and that's now I'm just sticking with it because it's really fun now. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so it sounds like uh, it, you, you took a taste. You ate the first potato chip in the bag, and now you're eating the whole bag of potato chips. What has kept you involved in FIRST? Well, the team members are really interesting. Um, they're very smart. It's uh, They all know how to, like, if you don't understand something, they're always going to be there to help you, like, understand it. So it's very, um, like, fun. You're never lost or anything. Um, I also like the coaches and all the opportunities that we get to be involved in. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yaritza, I'd sort of like to ask you the same question, but with a different angle. We have a very large audience here, and I'm not sure how many of them are actually involved in robotics right now. If you could persuade them to get involved in their high school robotics team, how would you do that? What would you say? Um, well, for me, I guess for how I would introduce like robotics. So like to explain myself a little bit, like how just like a little bit inside on how I got into robotics. I'm a very shy individual. When I started, uh, when I went into the Detroit Christian Ray, when I was going to school there, um, I knew nothing about robotics or anything that even, that it even existed. Um, I had like, I learned about it when I was going to the school because I had a cousin who was in the school who was also in the robotics program. And what she told me was that it's a place where you can learn to like 
like learn new skills, learn how to build, learn um, mechanics and all of that. And, like I've always been interested in like mechanics and all of that because um, my dad is actually a mechanic and I used to help him out when he does, he works on cars. So I used to help him out working with cars and like doing the mechanics and all of that. So when I first joined, I like floated around, saw how everyone worked, um, saw how like the programming did, the business, and then started realizing like, oh, they're all connected with one another. They all work together without one, the other can't function. Pretty much that's how I see robotics. Like it's just a big chain of everyone working together. Um, so I guess the main thing would be that is that like, for robotics, you get a lot of leadership skills, which is what I've gained from robotics. And you also get to learn about um, more, like your world expands a lot more than just a small one. Like when I entered um, a high school and I was, I, I just had a small view of the world. I was like, oh, there's just the simple careers of business and um, I don't know, engineering, but I didn't know there was like a specific one, which is, in, which is robotics, so. That's how I'd say. Super cool, thank you. Lisa, we've heard these students tell us a little bit about what drew them in to robotics. I wanted to ask you to give a look back. If you could give your younger self some advice, what would it be? That is a very good question uh, that I've been thinking about because I knew it was coming. Uh, I would like, I would recommend that you learn how to invent. Take some courses, even if you are going the business track, take some of those technical courses too. So I did take IT courses, so I did know how to code a little bit before it was call it, called coding, by the way. <laughs> uh, but even more of that, even if you do have a passion to go in the business direction, having that underlying tech foundation is important. I have the opportunity to work with a lot of engineers, of course, in what I do, software engineers, hardware engineers, and I always want to be the one inventing too. I do have the mind, I often have the vision, but I have to tell someone else to build it. So, <laughs> so having those skills are so important. So more along the lines of inventing and just follow your passions. Don't necessarily listen to what everyone else is telling you to do or what they want you to do or what your parents want you to do. Really just follow your passions and stay committed. Thank you. I'm going to ask the same question of Kelsey, although uh, I, I recognize that perhaps the space differential between when you got out of school and when you finished first and your career now isn't as great as mine is. But uh, if you had some advice to give your younger self, what would it be? Absolutely. So I definitely think, um, you know, from experience and from hearing other people's experiences, there are always going to be people telling you that you know, you, you can't do things, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you didn't, you didn't take enough AP classes, or you think you money, you something crazy, right? Um, so you always feel like you're behind, I get that, I, I always feel like I'm behind, um, but what was that? Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that no matter what other people think or say or anything like that, however they make you feel, you are perfectly capable of doing anything you want. So as long as you go into things with, you know, a good mentality that you're going to work hard and learn and it's okay if you fail, um, you're just going to try your best and learn as much as you can and see if you like it, um, you'll be perfectly successful. Um, so yeah, so just don't don't listen to all the things telling you that you're not good enough. Just think about how you know you're smart. You work hard. You you can catch up if you think you're behind. You know you can learn all the things you think you don't know, and you'll be successful. Thank you. Uh, I did want to ask our FRC and FTC team members, um, how do you balance? I robots, at least for me, like is all consuming. How do you balance your extracurriculars with your school. And I'd like to start with Yaritza on this one. Um, okay, so for me, <laughs> it's a little funny. Uh, so whenever I, uh, so for, for us school, our school um, luckily offers like 
So it's the school day and then we have like 40 minutes of extracurricular afterwards. So we get during those 40 minutes, we would usually like do homework, um, work on projects, like all of that. And you would usually work through them like during that time. And also if like I had to do like our robotics usually started at five ish when their school ended at four. So we would have another hour to work on our homework and such. And our, our uh, mentor and teachers were always very flexible with um, how we turned in our homework. Like, oh, if you need a little more time, we can give you this much time um, so you can turn it in. Or, oh, you have a competition, then we can give you this extended time. So our school is very flexible and very kind when it comes to our homework and turning in stuff. That's wonderful. That's so critical. Uh, Sumaya, is it the same for your school? How do you how do you balance it all? Okay, so my school is also kind of generous. So we have this thing where they only, for every class, they only get to assign two um, assignments per week. So it's kind of easy. So you don't have to do a lot of procrastinating. Um, I, you don't have to like put everything off until like the weekend or turn in everything late. You can, um, what is it? You could just do it right there. And what I like to do, so I'm not spending too much time on homework, I um, set like a 30 minute timer. So I'm kind of like challenging myself to get this all done. And it's very, um, it's very easy with balancing robotics too, because we don't, um, our practices are only two days. We only have it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, yeah, we're not like getting stressed out like that. That is, but but the the setting the timer is such critical advice. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, Andrea, do you have any uh, other kinds of advice like that that you can offer to our audience about how to balance uh, school and extracurriculars and time management? Um, well, I, me personally, I kind of struggle in that department, but just like Yurita said, um, I would try to take advantage of what's called EC extracurricular time. But also um, I would probably try doing my homework during lunch or doing like free time during classes. Um, but if not, you know, there's always homework at home. And like Rita mentioned, the school is pretty lenient. They're really supportive of our team and everything. So whenever there'd be like a paper due or anything, you know, we just talk to the teachers and they'd be pretty understanding. So, you know, the school is really like supportive of our team. So I feel like just like that connection in itself helps a lot with like homework. Thank you so much. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for advocacy at your school where you can say, I need, or as a student group, we need these things. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Lisa, we have a question in the chat um, from, uh, from Jeff. He wants to know where can or when will we be able to see a drone flying beyond the line of sight here in Michigan. What types of things do you believe it will carry? Oh, very interesting. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that question. Uh, yeah, there is some movement to look at enabling that. Uh, obviously, well, where we are based in Detroit, there's a lot of automotive presence and there are some different cases that would entail helping the automotive suppliers improve their supply chain even by getting parts to the assembly line more quickly. Um, we've, we've heard uh, a variety of different use cases that would help improve what I would call internal logistics operations and benefit businesses. Uh, there are also, of course, healthcare opportunities. So I just took part this past week in an organ transport demonstration in, in Ohio. We can certainly do something very similar in Michigan. I've been involved in two now, one in Maryland and one in Ohio. They were, were slightly different in terms of what their goals and objectives are, but what that was showing is that uh, the importance, organ logistics is probably the most complex logistical chain of people involved because you're recovering an organ from a donor and then having to transport it to a matching donee. And so you can imagine there's a lot of 
aviation, helicopters, ground surface transportation in the mix of moving that. And then as soon as it hits the ground transportation, every 10 minutes, uh, actually uh, that an organ is out of the body takes a year off the life of the organ. So getting caught up in traffic congestion can really hinder uh, the patient who's receiving its uh, longer term uh, health care and viability. So, so this is what I'm really proud to be working on. It's this kind of uh, new mobility, new form of package delivery. We're going to see that probably first it will be the drones for good type of use cases. I think those will be what uh, helps with the public acceptance, understanding that this is to transport an organ. It, it is a life-saving event. It's not necessarily about delivering uh, food <laughs> and hamburgers to a neighborhood, right? Uh, although that and that those types of use cases will follow on for sure. So, yeah, in Michigan, Airspace Link is uh, doing everything that we can do from our vantage point to start to move the needle in the direction uh, in the state of Michigan, where these beyond visual line of sight drone operations will take place on a more recurring basis. That, uh, that is super cool. I hadn't even imagined that, uh, that arena uh, for drone application. I wanted to ask Kelsey in a similar vein, what is it about your work that has completely caught you by surprise that was like the, oh, wow, moment for you? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, Hmm. I guess not not quite as exciting as um, Lisa's answer, but something that really just I wasn't expecting was how nice and helpful everyone is, um, which uh, might, might sound kind of lame, but, you know, I show up to work and I sit down next to people who I know I can trust that if I don't know what I'm doing, I can say that, say, you know, I don't know this, I need help and nobody will judge me. Nobody will think twice about helping me. You know, I have people of all ages and genders and races who are perfectly happy to sit down next to me and talk me through something. Or on the flip side, come ask me for advice. I'll have people who are like 60 years old asking me for help, um, which doesn't sound right, but we all help each other out, you know. Um, so that definitely honestly was a surprise. You know, I thought I had to know everything and everything would be very uptight and everyone would have high expectations. But really, you know, you can go into things and expect to learn and expect to get along with people and hang out after work and things like that. So it's very much more lax than you would think it is. So that was definitely a big surprise, but a very nice surprise for me. It almost sounds like your work environment is an extension of your experience on your first team. <laughs> yes, it really is. It's just a much harder FRC robot, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, there is a question uh, posed in the chat, actually, which was directed to me about what the coolest part of my job is. And as a business manager at JPL, you know, I have friends who say, well, you don't touch hardware. How could your job possibly be cool? I love going to work every day because I work with some of the coolest people on the planet. But in working with the coolest people on the planet, what's really great is when we do have a mission success, they look across the entire organization and they say, we made this happen. They are inclusive of the business team members. They're inclusive and respect the work that we do and recognize the work that we do as critical to bringing, to getting us to the launch pad, to getting us to sticking the landing, to getting us to be able to invent a helicopter that can fly on Mars. So. I would like to um, encourage everyone in the room to recognize that we each have strengths and our strengths are in our diversity. And the fact that our industry can be so expansive and embrace, uh, uh, embrace the diversity of talent that we have. A quick question back, we have only just a couple of moments, um, but I wanted to circle back with our FRC and FTC team members. And I wanted to ask, um, what caught you by surprise when you first joined your FRC or FTC team? What was your moment of shock and 
you know, I know I found my people and I found my place. And I'd like to start with Sumaya on this question. Sumaya, are you there? Um, mm. What was the question again? Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, just when you first joined your FTC team, what was your moment of, ah, wow, I found my people. What made you realize that it was the right move for you? Um, the competition. Um, when we first did a competition, I was kind of like skeptical because I didn't think we were going to win. I thought... Um, this was like just going to be the flat first and last competition, but then we ended up, ended up going to states. But the sadness is that we didn't go to worlds, but we're um we're doing it again this year. We went to competition, and now we're going to states again. Um, this year it hasn't started yet, but we are going to states, and now we're hoping that we go to worlds. But that was one of the um one of the interesting moments that I had that I really liked. So wonderful. Um, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to hear from Andrea and Yaritza on this because we're being sent back to the main room. But thank you to everyone for listening to our panel and a special thanks to all of our panelists for sharing.